Hello everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Final Fantasy Bestiary. This series is dedicated towards discovering the history and lore behind some of Final Fantasy's most iconic creatures and characters. In this episode, we will be finishing part 2 of our Super Boss Roundup. If you missed part 1, be sure to check the I in the top right corner of the video. We left off finishing Final Fantasy VI's Super Bosses, so with that, we move on to the game that, in some of our eyes, probably made Super Bosses something we really expect in the Final Fantasy series. Final Fantasy VII. When this game released in Japan, it actually only had one super boss, Ultimate Weapon, which is this game's ultimate weapon. While Ultimate is definitely an optional boss that has some power in his kit, he is far from the super bosses that came after. Hell, even Diamond Weapon wasn't in the Japanese release of Final Fantasy VII, at least not a fightable version. When we got the game over here in America and in the other regions, we got Ruby and Emerald Weapon, two monstrous bosses who encourage super specific strategies to take down. Whether that be glitches, or grinding out the double summon materia with Hades and Knights of the Round, or spamming Omni Slash, these enemies were tough back in the day. Crisis Core, just to mention it, also had Minerva as a super boss as part of the Great Caverns of Wonders for the game's mission system. Final Fantasy VIII continued Final Fantasy VII's use of ultimate weapons as an optional super boss, this time just calling him Ultima Weapon. Hell, he even has Cloud's Ultima Weapon in his hand. Found at the bottom of the Deep Sea Research Center after defeating Bahamut, one could draw the ultimate guardian force, Eden, from him. He is considered tough, especially since his attacks are incredibly potent, but his power pales in comparison to the one weapon that didn't make it into the original Final Fantasy VII, Omega. Remember that Omega and Omega Weapon are two different entities, and we're talking about Omega Weapon here. Omega Weapon looks similar to Ultima, but has a greatly increased health pool, especially if on the PlayStation version, where he's always level 100. He absorbs all elemental magic and has several attacks that can destroy the party in seconds. That being said, outside of his physical attacks, he is extremely predictable, so as long as the player executes on keeping people alive, Omega Weapon will fall eventually. He drops the Proof of Omega, basically a congratulations certificate. I should go and get that printed at CVS or something. Final Fantasy IX did not continue the trend of using weapons like Ultima and Omega in its arsenal of super bosses, but instead it has one of the most infuriating balls I've ever had to face, Ozma. Likely a forgotten idol on that has lost its shape, this guy can go die in a fire as far as I'm concerned. To even physically attack him, you need to complete the Friendly Enemy side quest, which will also make him able to be hit with Shadow Elemental damage. This is especially useful since his Doomsday attack actually hits him as well, normally healing him, but with the Friendly Enemies quest done, it will instead deal damage to him. With his ability to fill his ATB gauge when the party targets him, before their commands even execute, makes him incredibly difficult on top of the super random nature of his attacks, it's just not a boss that you can cheese all too well. It will really take all the prep and even some luck to get you to beat Ozma. The good news is that Ozma has a really, really, really low health pool for a super boss, only 55,535, making it so that with good RNG, his attacks can be felled in pretty much a few turns. Should you succeed, you will actually receive something for beating him. Arc, Garnet's Final Summon. Final Fantasy X is probably the Final Fantasy with the single most amount of super bosses, and the first Final Fantasy where you really start wondering, were they crazy when they started coming up with numbers like this? Though, a lot of the super bosses in this game most people really wouldn't consider. The game does have Ultima Weapon and Omega Weapon, but they are pansies until they were re-released in the international version, where their health pools and strengths actually make them somewhat considerable super bosses, at least before you have some of the crazy power that you can get later on with the Celestial Weapons. The big winner for super bosses is in the Monster Arena, where incredibly powerful enemies are created by capturing the fiends out in Spira. Plenty of them can spank the party pretty hard, though Nemesis is the penultimate, and not penultimate, he is the ultimate super boss in the arena, boasting 10 million health and several deadly attacks. In the international version though, he is not the toughest one, as there's some new kids on the block. The Dark Aeons. These super buffed fights take place against every one of the game's summons and make them incredibly difficult, sometimes feeling downright unfair. While defeating them is tough, they are only a precursor to the ultimate final boss, final super whatever boss, Penance, who appears flying over the Calmlands once the Dark Aeons have been defeated. 
able to unleash Judgment Day, an attack that deals 99,999 damage and deals 999 MP worth of damage. Very specific strategies are needed to prevent this attack from occurring, and if it does, well, bye bye. And to be fair, Final Fantasy X-2 was no slouch in the Super Boss department either. The Via Infinito was a 100 floor dungeon that contained several very powerful bosses, including the final super boss, Trema, the founder of New Yevon. All of the other super bosses in here are actually former members of the Yevon faith and can definitely give you a run for your money if you're not prepared. Some of them include Unaleska, her husband, Seymour, Kinnock, and Lord Jiskel. You don't actually fight them, you fight the fiends that were formed from them being sent off and never being properly... You know the whole story of Final Fantasy X, not here to explain it. Anger Mainyu is another super boss that appears in the Bicanel Desert and is capable of dealing insane damage and status effects to the party. In the international version, there's something called Last Mission, where you can encounter Major Numerus, a four-headed boss that is considered to be one of the most difficult super bosses in the series. Additionally, Shinra's fiend, Almighty Shinra, can be fought as a super boss as well. Final Fantasy XI, it's an MMO, so it's a tough yet easy game to talk about super bosses. It's only tough because it was an MMO, and pretty much all the content can be considered super bosses. Sky, Sea, Dynamis, Limbus, Kings, and Harry are Salvage. There's so many things that be, could be considered super bosses here. The thing that's easy about this is picking just two. The first one we're going to talk about is Screenix's. I'd say it's its ultimate, and I quote, Go fuck yourself, laugh in your face, fight. Unquote. Absolute virtue. The boss could only be accessed after killing another super boss, Jailer of Love, and could only be weakened by fighting Jailer of Love in a very specific way. Even in his weakened state, and I say that with air quotes, he is capable of every two hour special ability in the game prior to the release of Treasures of Otter Gone, and can repeat them over and over again unless the alliance fighting him locks him out by performing the ability at the exact same time, or at least within a second or two of his activation. For a lot of people that didn't live in Japan, this was damn near impossible without the use of bots. That's how tight the window was for locking out his two hour abilities. And even with this in mind, his damage was insane, his attacks are insane, his ads were annoying, one meteor out of him pretty much meant the end of the fight. If he used mana font, that's it, you better flee. And if you didn't lock them out properly, he could actually use several of the two hours in conjunction as he loses his health, making it even harder to counter him. Things just did not go well here, especially if you made it under 39% and got him into his famous bracelet mode, where meteor becomes an attack he can just use whenever he wants. The big commotion about Absolute Virtue, and why I'm bringing him up, is that for years, players were defeating him. Though the methods basically involved glitches and bugs to render him unable to fight back. When they finally nerfed this bad boy, along with the other super boss, which we'll talk about this scenario, players had a few days where the famous Dark Knight Zerg strategy could work on him and end in victory, granting some of the most powerful items in the game. The strategy was nerfed within a few days though, so it was very short-lived enjoyment. I remember it very well. It wasn't until after the level 80 cap that a group of players managed to defeat him legitimately. The other big super boss of Final Fantasy XI is Pandemonium Warden, probably the most popular video game boss in history, though for all the wrong reasons. Pandemonium Warden was a boss that consisted of 20 different super bosses all in one, including the demon himself. Each form came with its own health bar and several adds. After a group fought and failed to defeat this beast after 18 hours of continuous play, they began to feel ill as the adrenaline wore off. Despite being on the final form and just beginning to learn how to overcome its deadly summoner abilities, the team called it quits for the sake of their health. This caught the attention of Yahoo News, who wrote a piece about the boss and how it was literally the opposite of Square Enix's warning before opening Final Fantasy XI, asking players to ensure they put their real lives before the game. This, along with Absolute Virtue's incredible strength, led Square Enix to drastically reduce the health of these two bosses and put a two-hour time limit on their encounters. Pandemonium Warden also had his total forms reduced down to 10, at which point the Apathy Link Shell managed to defeat him, followed by more Link Shells after the fact. I'd say based on the commotion they caused, these two super bosses take the cake for super bosses in 11. Now somehow we have to follow up those stories with Final Fantasy XII, which again, has some pretty good super bosses. Uh, there were plenty of tough bosses out in the world, mostly part of the Mark system, 
Yazmat, however, stirred up a bit of interest when players saw his health values in the original version, over 50 million health. The fight itself is actually pretty easy, but a poorly prepared party can easily make the fight take way longer or make it way harder than intended. Omega Mark 12 can also be accessed after defeating Yazmat. While he's much simpler, both of his iterations, while they have different health values and slightly different attack patterns, both of them can be incredibly frustrating, especially when he was released here in the West, and all of his auto attacks, which by the way was the only attack he used, inflicted the Berserk status effect. Additionally, all of the Espers, including Zodiac and Ultima, can be considered super bosses in their own right. And in the International Edition, Trial Mode was implemented, with the final fight after Omega Mark 12 being the five judges of the game all at once. Those who have played this version of the game consider this to be the true ultimate super boss of Final Fantasy XII. Now we move on to Final Fantasy XIII, and I was actually pretty impressed when I was doing my research on these super bosses. First of all, it did have a similar system to Final Fantasy XII with the Mark system, called the Seathstone Missions. These would take you across Grand Pulse, facing tons of powerful enemies and bosses. Among them, there was the Gigantar, which was a fairly strong boss. However, the, Versin the Versingetorix, I believe that's how it's pronounced, is the final boss of these missions, sporting several million HP and extremely deadly attacks. That being said, people who don't care about getting a 5-star rating can actually just chain debuffs on him, especially the poison debuff, which will kill him eventually. That's how I did it. The other enemy in the game is considered a super boss is the Long Gui, an enemy that only appears after finishing most of the Seathstone missions and Titan's Trials. It will replace the standard Adamantoises, which were pretty hard on their own right in Grand Pulse, and can easily wipe out parties if they don't stagger its legs and kill it as quickly as possible. 13-2 also sported some great super bosses. In the main game itself, the Long Gui and Yomi are the first super bosses you really encounter, with Yomi just being a weaker version of Versin Versingetorix, I can't say that name. Repsaddle is a new seat that is not only really tough, he also summons adds. Can use HP drain and can actually reduce the max HP of your party members. However, most people remember 13-2 for its DLC super bosses. A lot of them are fun, yet still tough, including a bout against Lightning and her original commanding, a commanding officer, and actually a fight against Omega. However, a few in particular take incredible preparations to defeat. Snow and Gilgamesh both spot nearly 10 million HP. Speaking of Gilgamesh, I mentioned this in his bestiary that I did, but he seems to basically be a Deadpool parody in this version. He breaks the fourth wall and pulls out tons of machine guns resembling Deadpools. It's just fun to note. The ultimate super boss, Valfadir, must be defeated five times to be truly beaten, and his health and power increase with each incarnation. His final form has an effective health pool of over 30 million, considering he cuts all damage he receives in half. Then we move on to Lightning Returns, which contains three total super bosses, one of them holding the record for the highest health Final Fantasy boss to date. That boss's name is Aeronite, a dragon in the giant sandbox. Not only does he spot really high health and initial resistances, but the fight has a time limit. If you are unable to stagger him within three minutes of the encounter beginning, or his previous stagger, he will flee and fully heal. You can stagger him up to four times, and he really doesn't take much damage at all without being staggered. At most, this gives you 12 minutes to beat him, though in reality you'll probably stagger him in 90 to 120 seconds until after the fourth stagger, in which case your true 3 minute DPS test begins. He also gets more aggressive and more powerful with each stagger, so expect to use items and powerful attacks to end him quickly. On his original difficulty, he has a mere 11 million, not really the highest if you look at Yasmat, but on hard mode with a chaos infusion, he can have 57.7 million health trumping Yasmat's HP. Arishkigal is the second super boss fought in the Ultimate Lair, an optional dungeon only accessible if the player earned a 13th day by completing enough side quests. He too can have his HP brought up much higher on hard mode, plus Chaos Infusion, though not as high as Aeronite's. He's also very aggressive, so he can potentially give the player a harder time than Aeronite. Now one thing that Lightning Returns did that not many other Final Fantasy games can claim that they've done is make their last boss a super boss. Most of the time, super bosses are just more powerful than the last bosses of the games they're in. However, on New Game Plus, on hard mode, Bunavelza has over 30 million HP and is the most aggressive of the three bosses mentioned here. Some consider him the hardest actual boss of the game under these circumstances.
Moving on to Final Fantasy XIV, just like with Final Fantasy XI, the game is an MMO, so really any of the optional bosses could be considered super bosses. That means Extreme Primals, the Binding Coil, the Odin and Behemoth Fates even, and of course some of the s rank Mark Hunts are all under consideration. However, most would consider the bosses in the second coil of Bahamut Savage and Alexander Gordius Savage to be super bosses, especially the Manipulator, a machine that guards the power source of the right shoulder of Alexander. Only a few thousand people have managed to beat him and some of these other super bosses and complete their raid tiers. Hell, you know what? Final Fantasy XV's demo, Episode Dusuke, even has two technical super bosses, Behemoth and Kotobopa. While they aren't really super bosses, they both can wipe the floor with the party in seconds, especially the Katobopa, who can pretty much one-shot anyone. It takes careful strategy and a lot of extra leveling to take these two on. And that's gonna have to be a wrap for part two on the super bosses. Of course, the other titles contain some super bosses as well, but this series really focuses on the main titles while occasionally looking at their sequels. Thank you for watching this episode of Final Fantasy Bestiary. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and check out some of my other Bestiary videos. They're joining all the other videos in the eye in the top right corner of the, of the video. I said video like five times. Anyway, I'll see you guys in the next one, and until then, take care.